Hello everyone, it's me again, and today I'll be discussing something that has been on my mind for the past several weeks. It's kind of one of the, the, the major thing that I'm doing in my current rotation right now. I mentioned before that I, I was uh, making these Bacler virus constructs and um, trying to express recombinant protein. Now, you know, what, what the heck am I talking about? Well, a lot of you might be familiar with this system, but I figure I should kind of do a review for people, people who might not be familiar with it or people who are thinking about using the system but you know not sure really what it is so this is kind of a, a general review of, of the of the uh, system so what I'm using is something called the back-to-back uh, -back system which is uh, made by Invitrogen and basically it exploits the uh, Bacler virus and it allows generation of uh, of any kind of protein that you want, basically. So allows you to generate these proteins for crystallization because it can produce tons of this stuff, or maybe for you know different other assays that you might want to do. So I will be using this kind of diagram figure to uh, kind of explain what this is, and this is just in the manual itself uh, by Invitrogen. So when you buy the kit, you get you know this manual, and you can also download it download it online on the website but I think this is a really good figure so I'm just gonna kind of go through it and uh, tell you what's what's really going on so at the beginning that you want to clone your uh, your gene into the uh, donor plasmid now um, I'm gonna make a series of videos and going through the whole cloning stuff but you know, supposedly you have the DNA that you want, that you want to clone in, you know, it's correct, you've sequenced it, everything's good, it's in frame in the in the donor plasmid, and you know, then you you've decided to transform it and get it to uh insert into the plasmid through, you know, restricted enzyme sites. But but the thing is, you know, there's different kind of recombinant donor plasmid you can use for this system. So this is kind of vary by your experiments. I use PFAS back one because it's just the simplest one. I don't need any all the other fancy stuff. Like PFAS back HT, I think has a um, his uh, a his a his tag, a poly his tag that can be cleaved off by a protease later on in the experiment after you purify. You know, you can cleave that part off. But anyway, the thing is that my gene has a leader sequence, a GP67 leader sequence that already has a poly his tag on it. So you know, I didn't really need any fancy plasmid. My gene already contained it. So. Anyway, well, so what's interesting is that the donor plasmid, you know, let's just say PFAS back one, you have uh, two flanking sites actually, you know, the TNN7R and TNN7L, and this is what 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 the what's key about this plasmid is that because it has these flanking sites, this is the uh, sorry because it has these flanking sites. It allows the uh, recombination to occur once you transform them into another set of cells and through the uh, transposon system, the TN7 transposon system. So, so that leads basically that you, you take this plasmid and then you transform to these DH10 back cells. And once you do that, then you have these flanking sites, the TN7R, TN7L transposon sites, and it'll kind of, you know, recombine with the target mini ATTTN7 site. Due to these flanking sequences, Transposon, this transposon system works. Actually, the helper, uh, it also contains a helper uh, plasmid, and this helper plasmid in bacteria provides uh, proteins that actually aids in this uh, whole recombination um, step. So, what's interesting that I find that's really interesting is that this, so this portion of the back mid, now the back mid is just, you know, the back virus DNA in the bacteria. It's like 160 kilobases, so it was really large. But within the within the back mid and within this um, mini ATT TN7 site, you have the laxi alpha peptide sequence as well. Once you have this gene of interest inserted into this area, it actually disrupts the laxi alpha peptide, and that you know causes uh, that basically negates alpha complementation. You know, in order for you know for a blue white screening, so. What happens is that this becomes disrupted, and this backbone also carries the the gene, uh, the gene for uh, what is it? Uh, oh yeah, the beta galactosidase gene, right? So it needs the beta galactosidase gene and also the alpha you know, peptide in order to 
in order to uh, create beta galactosidase, basically, and then it cleaves the uh, beta galactosidase in the X gal or blue gal that you put on, and that you know results in the uh, blue color because it hydrolyzes the uh, the carbohydrate into monosaccharides. But but yeah, so that's how the screening works, which I'll get into a little bit later. I'm kind of running ahead of myself a little bit. But yeah, so basically just know that insertion of this gene into the site disrupts the LAC-Z alpha peptide uh, expression level. And um, as you can see, this, this cell also contains, uh, the plasma also contains a tetracycline resistance marker, a canamycin resistance marker, and also a genomycin resistance marker. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why they have ampicillin here. Um, well, actually, no, I know why, because this itself we need to uh, select using ampicillin, but this genomycin marker should be within this site, actually. I'm not sure why this is like that. This might be uh, might be wrong, but I'm not 100% sure, because I know that the genomycin marker is supposed to be in this insert area, so once, you know, you have this uh, transposed into the back mid, then you can you have like a triple resistance selection method. You have tetracycline, canomycin, and genomycin, but anyway... So once you have that transposed, right, you have this foreign gene or gene of interest, and then basically it disrupts the LAC-Z, disrupts the LAC-Z alpha peptide expression, and then any col colonies that grow will be white, and any colonies that, did, that this did not happen, or, yeah, this did not happen, basically, or if it happened and, you know, there was no insert, it will remain blue, because because uh, this uh, sequence does not become disrupted, so it will become blue be due to the hydrolysis of the, uh, uh, of, the uh, of the carbohydrates. So, so yeah, so basically then at this point, so at this point, when you transform, you know, you wait 48 hours, so once, once that happens, you should see kind of a mixture of blue and white colonies, depending on the competency of your cells, you know, and how much DNA you use, um, well, in the protocol, it says to use one nanograms, uh, you have five microliters, so you use like you dilute your uh, DNA to like 0.2 nanograms per microliters. But um, that's for commercial cells. If you're making your own uh, DH10 bags, I will use around 100 nanograms. Really, I've been using 100 nanograms, and it's been working fairly well. One nanogram is just I've been getting really bad false uh, false uh, positive colonies. Um, so basically, once you have this, so you pick the white colonies, then you restreak them out on a plate to see, you know, if they really are white or not. And then, of course, you're gonna just pick those colonies and do a prep of it in order to uh, purify uh, the back of the DNA. And once you have this, then the rest is well, I shouldn't say the rest is simple, but. It, it's kind of like this. So the Bachman system, you have all this cloning stuff you need to do at the beginning, right? You need to clone your gene into the donor plasma, and you know, and, and, and then you gotta transform, and then you gotta purify that, and you gotta transform your DH10, and then you gotta make sure it's, you select the correct uh, clones, and you gotta confirm that by PCR or sequencing. So there's a lot of molecular biology stuff, and then you know, after you have the DNA, then you gotta go into kind of the virology aspect of the project, which is. Um, you know, transfection into SF9 or SF21 insect cells in order to see if you can generate these recombinant bacterial virus with your gene of interest and get to get that expressed. Um, and this is basically that's this is basically what it's showing. Of course, you can you know determine the viral titer by using plug assays. You know to calculate the PFU, and then if you know the PFU, you can calculate the MOI or the multiplic multiplicity of infection in order to determine you know the optimal um, those for infecting your cells. So that's pretty much the overall uh, um, idea of the back-to-back uh, -back system by Invitrogen. Um, I know I kind of went by went kind of fast on that one. You know, this is again very impromptu because I'm sorry, I'm not a guy who writes out scripts and stuff and memorize them and then you know read them off or whatever. I know that might sound better, I guess, but uh, this is not my thing. It's not my style, so. I'm sorry if this isn't very clear or you missed something that I said, but let me know, okay? Because I really do want to help because I've been through this for the past several weeks and, you know, this is giving me a lot of trouble in some of these parts. I know it sounds simple, right? It's relatively straightforward, but it really isn't, honestly, especially if you have to do, do like a triple ligation, which I had to do. That was not fun. But anyway, um, but yeah, that's pretty much the system of the back-to-back the -back system. And if everything goes well, you're, you're, you'll be able to generate tons of recombinant protein. 
Now, there's other many aspects I didn't even mention. For example, again, I want to make some, a series of videos about cloning, but the cloning your gene is extremely important to exactly you know how you're doing it. That's extremely important. Um, you got to make sure it's in frame, etc. And another thing is that um, right? Another thing is the competency of your cells. I kind of briefly mentioned that whether you're making your own or using commercial stuff. And the last thing is false uh, white colonies. So they look positive, but if you pick them and try to grow them up again, they won't grow. And that's kind of weird, right? So you also got to be careful with that. So that's why at this step, when you're picking colonies, you got to pick like the whitest, largest, you know, most robust looking colony um, on the plate. Don't pick any ones that, that look kind of small and kind of small and just kind of like very faint. Don't do that because trust me, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, so if everything goes well, you know, this whole entire thing will take you about a week to finish. But, you know, once you get to this part, this is a whole other animal once you get to the recombinant backlog virus stuff. Because then you gotta spend time, you know, optimizing the conditions, see if you can, you know, recover the virus or not. Because this transfection with, with uh, self, self-action too, you know, ideally it's, it's very efficient, but, you know, depending on the purity of your DNA and how much DNA you have, and I don't know the alignment of the planets and stuff. You might not be able to recover the common and backlar virus. So then you're gonna have to try again. But you know, as long as you have the correct back mid DNA, then this step should work. You know, at this point, it's just um, at this point, it's just kind of you know optimizing, optimizing it for your experiment and such. So so yeah. But that was kind of a general overview of the back-to-back uh, -back system. I just kind of want to make a video of it because I've been doing this lately and I figured, hey, why not? So, yeah. And I haven't forgotten about the PCR video, the part two background. I just haven't gotten time to do that yet, but I will soon. Maybe today, maybe. But, um, um, but we'll see. But yeah, thanks for listening, guys. And uh, I guess I'll talk to you guys later then. All right.